Okay. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Tom Fitton. I'm president of Judicial Watch. Judicial Watch is a conservative, nonpartisan educational foundation dedicated to promoting transparency, accountability, and integrity in government politics and the law. Through its educational endeavors, Judicial Watch advocates high standards of ethics and morality in our nation's public life and seeks to ensure that political and judicial officials obey the law and do not abuse the powers entrusted to them by the American people. Judicial Watch is concerned about the integrity, obviously, of our courts and has also worked to ensure that presidential nominees to the federal bench, uh, especially the Supreme Court, are experienced, ethical, and reject judicial activism. It is in this context that Judicial Watch first sought access through the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, from the Justice Department about then Solicitor General Elena Kagan and the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obama Obamacare, back in on June 19th of last year. It was in the middle of the debate about her pending confirmation to the Supreme Court and the documents we thought would shed light on her views on limited government and the U.S. Constitution. And more directly, the documents could have shed light on whether Ms. Kagan might need to recuse herself from considering any Obamacare challenges that may end up before the High Court. The Justice Department admitted that it searched and found responsive documents within weeks of our request and a similar request from our friends at the Media Research Center. In fact, documents were not released until both Media Research and Judicial Watch sued separately in federal court to force the Justice Department to comply with the law. Scandalously, the Justice Department withheld relevant documents not only from the American people, but from the very U.S. Senate considering her nomination. This goes beyond the issue of whether Justice Kagan should recuse herself. It goes to whether the DOJ intentionally withheld material information from Congress and violated FOIA law to ease then Solicitor General Kagan's path to nomination. So those documents we sued for were finally released this past spring, months and months after we had initially asked for them, and they included emails that suggest, in the least, the Solicitor General's Office of the Justice Department, which had been run by Ms. Kagan, was more involved in the legal defense of Obamacare than had been previously understood. Another set of documents released last month consists of emails showing that Solicitor General Kagan's seeming personal and excited support for the passage of Obamacare. These document dumps forced through federal lawsuits have caused quite the furor and led to loud calls for Justice Kagan to recuse herself from the Obamacare constitutional challenges the High Court is now considering. And the House Judiciary Committee opened an inquiry into what else the Department of Justice has in the way of testimony and documents about this controversy. It is all quite unprecedented. Joining us today to give you more details and legal analysis are nationally recognized experts and leaders on law and the courts. First joining, and I encourage you, uh, their bios I will not be able to do justice, so I encourage you to Google their names individually. You can see all their glorious work. Uh, but first joining us is Carrie Saravino, who is the Chief Counsel and Policy Director of the Judicial Crisis Network, which is specifically called Ms. Kagan to recuse herself. Until March 2010, she was the Olin Searle Fellow and a Dean's Visiting Scholar at Georgetown Law, and she previously was a law clerk to the uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Clarence Thomas and to Judge David Santel over at the U.S. Court of Appeals at the D.C. Circuit. Ed Whelan is the President of the Ethics and Public Policy Center. He directs the Center's program for the Constitution, the Courts, and the Culture. His areas of expertise include constitutional law and the judicial confirmation process, and as a contributor to National Review's online uh, National Review Online's Bench Memos blog. He has been a leading commentator on nominations to the Supreme Court, the lower courts, and on issues of constitutional law. Uh, he, once again, he's a lawyer and a former law clerk to Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. He served in positions of responsibilities in all three branches of government, including uh, the Office of Legal Counsel, where he was Assistant Attorney General. So we're honored to have him yeah, here. Principal Deputy, no, not, not Pr principal de pr oh, I've just read the Assistant Attorney General part, but... You get the idea. Uh, and he also worked at the Senate as well. Russell Wheeler is a visiting fellow in the Brookings Institution's Governance Studies Program and uh, president of its Governance Institute, a small think tank with a special interest in interbranch relations. Uh, prior to that, from 1991 to 2005, he was the deputy director of the Federal Judicial Center and the Federal Courts, uh, which was the Federal Courts Research and Continuing Education Agency. Uh, and pr prior to that, he had worked with the National Center for State Courts and the United States Supreme Court. 
and his uh, issues and publications deal principally with the United States courts, in particular judicial selection, ethics, and non-case related behavior. Uh, he was, uh, he, he's an international expert and uh, he's currently uh, with the Supreme Court Fellows Commission. Also, uh, last but not least, is uh, Professor Ronald Rotunda, the Doi and Dean the Doy and D. Henley Chair and Distinguished Professor of Jurisprudence at Chapman University in Orange, California. Prior to that, uh, he was a university professor and professor of law at George Mason and uh, uh, has had a long and distinguished career uh, that also included the University of Illinois. He is a, a, a he clerked it for Judge Manfield way back when and also served as assistant majority counsel for the Watergate Committee. So uh, he's seen it all. And as importantly, though, he's served, he's co-authored the most widely used course book on legal ethics and is the author of a leading course book on constitutional law. So I've deferred uh, discussing the specific emails and documents in the hopes that my pa our panelists are, are able to get into it a little bit. What we're going to do is everyone's going to uh, make some introductory remarks. Uh, lay out the case or the questions or the analysis they think that the public needs to know about. We'll talk about it a little bit here uh, at the panel. We'll talk a little bit more amongst ourselves and we'll open the floor up for questions and comments. Uh, if you have cell phones, if you could take a minute to uh, turn them off or turn them down, that would be appreciated. And uh, when it does come time for question time, uh, please wait for the microphone so uh, those viewing on the internet can hear what you're asking. Thank you. And uh, to start off, uh, I'm pleased to introduce to Carrie Servino. Uh, yep, yeah, come on up. Thank you, Tom. I'm going to move the microphone down just a little bit. Sure. The right height. If you're looking at a closely uh, watched sports game but between two great teams, common sense tells you that the same person can't play coach and then later in the game serve as a referee. Common sense tells you that, and in the case of federal law, it says, tells us the same thing. If you've been counsel in a case, you cannot later, in the same case, sit as judge. And that is what we argue that Elena Kagan has done in this case. Now, since I'm the first person to talk, I want to just step back and give kind of a, a review of what the facts are in this case and what we know. So we're all talking about really the same issues. There have been, um, you know, every time something like this happens, there's a lot of different things going on, and particularly with some of the most recent releases of, of more exciting emails of this is simply amazing she says about about the lock so people get distracted by some of those emails and forget all of the uh, documents that were released earlier that I think go, are more pertinent to the central issue here of whether Justice Kagan needs to recuse herself so as I'm sure most of you are familiar the Solicitor General's office where Justice Kagan was head normally their job is chiefly to defend the United States in, and litigate on behalf of the United States in Supreme Court cases. Uh, they also take it, get involved at the appellate level in cases they have to okay any time the Department of Justice is going to appeal a case. So, but generally their, their duties never really kick in until the appellate stage of, nomination, of, of litigation. Um, so th that's one thing that makes this an interesting case because all of the, the activity that we're talking about uh, with Justice Kagan in this law occurred before uh, the law was before the health care law was even passed, and then um, as the case was just starting in the district court. So during her nomination process, there were, there were questions as to whether Justice Kagan would have to recuse herself on this because many times in big cases like this, it's something that's discussed as a, as a matter of, of through all the Department of Justice at meetings that the just that uh, then Solicitor General Kagan would have attended, um, even though it's not something that's normally dealt with at her office officially yet. From the documents that Tom referenced that have come out through these FOIA requests and, and lawsuits, um, we know now that the Obama administration did not wait until the law, their health care law even was signed into law to start a, a defense of that law. We have documents showing that they were planning uh, strategy meetings as early as January 2010, and the law wasn't passed until March, and that's where we first see Justice Kagan actually being involved. We see an email earlier that she was going back and forth with her with her uh, principal deputy counting the votes for it, but that, you know, anyone could do that. In January, there's an email going around saying, hey, we're having these strategy meetings. Do you want uh, the Solicitor General's office should be involved, right? And uh, Neil Catyell, her principal deputy, sa sends her this. She says, uh, and he, then he reports back, Elena definitely wants the Office of Solicitor General involved. 
uh, and I'm going to be the point person, but I'm going to keep Elena in the loop. I'll, I'll, I'll bring Elena in as needed is the words on, on that. Uh, they have their meeting on January 13th, and uh, then there's a two-month gap that, that, uh, Sen that Representative Smith has referenced. And then on March 5th, we know that Justice Kagan uh, was n notified that she was going to be on the short list, perhaps, for a, a potential Supreme Court opening. There was no opening yet, but people were suspecting that, that Justice Stevens would step down. So she knows she's on the short list March 5th, um, and she, her testimony is that she continued on in her, in her regular duties uh, as, as Solicitor General at that time until uh, sometime in April or May. So um, on March 18th now, we have emails going back and forth talking about having another strategy meeting about, about the Obamacare case and or the, 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 the PIPACA, the, the uh, uh, health care law. And Justice Kagan has copied on some email chains in that too. First, she has her um, deputy who is there. They're talking about the, the agenda for the meeting. They're talking about some information in the meeting that is not um, revealed in the FOIA documents. We have... We have uh, redacted, excerpted portions. So the emails look, for those of you who are here, the emails look kind of like this. They've got parts blacked out of them um, that is internal information. So we have her receiving internal information at that point in March 18th. On March 21st, the House votes on the law, they, and they're getting ready to have this meeting again. And uh, her deputy, Neil Catyell, says, why don't you come to this meeting? This is something you should be at. And her response was, what's your phone number? Uh, at that point, he emails her back a phone number, and the, and the record goes dead as to her, her involvement um, on email in this. Uh, the strategy meeting happens March 22nd. The cases are filed, uh, the ones that are being up to the Supreme Court right now, on March 23rd. And uh, then on April 9th, we have Justice Stevens announcing his retirement. So now there's an actual vacancy in the Supreme Court. Um, somewhere in that same time, Justice Kagan testified that she stopped attending the general attorney general's meetings that normally she would have been at that would have been probably discussing this litigation, and she said early to mid-April. And then on May 10th, she was finally nominated to the Supreme Court. So my, my case is that there are three main reasons that Justice Kagan needs to recuse herself, all going back to t uh, the law 28 U.S.C. 455b3. This governs... 455 governs when judges need to recuse themselves from cases. B3 governs when a former government employee that's now a judge needs to recuse himself. And it says that if, as a government employee, you participated as counsel or advisor in the case, then you have to recuse yourself. I think there's three things that show that Justice Kagan clearly was participating as counsel. One is, as I mentioned, she's the one who, who made the okay to bring this case into her office. It wasn't something that just happened there in the normal course of events because there was an appeal. She actually had to reach out and say, yes, this is something important enough that our office is going to get involved in these strategy meetings um, extraordinarily early, but not only before it's filed in district court, before it's filed in district court, before the bill is even passed into law. Second of all, she did the, the, the um, decision as to who would take over it. If she was recused in a case, for example, you, you wouldn't, that she wouldn't be able to say, well, I'm going to pick this person to be the point person on this topic or this person. She would just be out and it would automatically devolve onto her, her principal deputy. But she's the one who got to choose who to put on the case. She chose her political deputy, Neil Cat, you're the only other political appointee in the office, to take charge of this litigation. Um, and he said he was going to bring her in as needed. So she's still in the loop. And then uh, third, she was receiving internal information. So we've got information that is sufficiently private that we can't get it through FOIA. This is privileged information that is sufficiently private that if Justice Kagan, uh, has, has she, since she's received this information, she cannot even share it with her own colleagues on the Supreme Court. Uh, you don't give attorney-client privilege information to someone who's not an attorney in the case. And that, and that is, I think, just the nail in the coffin for um, any arguments that she uh, could sit on the case. Now, typically, it, for recusal issues of former government employees, the fact that you had staffed a case, the fact that you had, had been the one to, to okay being, it being brought into the office would normally even be enough in the normal practice of someone, say, moving from DOJ work into the private practice. But I think, it, particularly in light of the fact that she's received privileged inside information in this case that the other justices don't have, that the other parties don't have, that, that clearly indicates she has participated in this counsel, in, as counsel in this case. So uh, there have been lots of debates going back and forth. How much did she participate? If you look at the, if you look at the case law, it really boils down to, did she have personal participation in this case? She did. All right, she's out. There's, there's, uh, it, it, they don't think the precedent requires a level of substantial participation. In some circuits even, you just, just the fact that she was Solicitor General herself is probably enough just to recuse herself, even if she never even knew the case was in her office. So um, 
our argument is this is going to be well, an important case of the century. It, it is not the time to uh, relax our recusal standards. This is the time that we need uh, justices in the court who can legally and can ethically sit on this case. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Ed, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, I believe that Kerry Severino has presented a powerful case for Justice Kagan's recusal under 28 U.S.C. Uh, 455b3. I'll note that I haven't seen anyone seriously contest the case that she's actually made. I haven't seen anyone engage with the actual arguments and evidence that she's relied on. There are some folks who have uh, undertaken to defend Elena Kagan's non-recusal um, but, but not by actually addressing these arguments. Now, rather than uh, repeat and reinforce what Kerry has said, I'm instead going to uh, address the factual assertion that Justice Kagan was, quote, walled off from the Obamacare litigation. And I want to make two points here. The first is that that factual assertion might charitably be described as convenient revisionism. And the second is I'd like to, to explore what would follow if that factual assertion were in fact true. And I'd like to explain why, if that assertion were in fact true, Kagan, Justice Kagan, would be required to recuse herself under 28 U.S.C. 455A, the provision that requires that a uh, justice not take part in a matter where her impartiality might reasonably be questioned. Now, much of what Kerry has said, uh, I think, uh, clearly refutes the factual assertion that uh, Justice Kagan was walled off. But I want to, to uh, highlight where this uh, myth uh, seems to have first developed. Specifically, uh, on June 15, 2010, about one month after uh, Elena Kagan had been nominated to the court, uh, her political deputy, uh, Neil Cotillal, sent her an email where he informed her that he had told Attorney General Holder that, quote, you have been walled off from day one, close quote, from, from the litigation over Obamacare. Now, this uh, statement, he explains, was made in, in response to Attorney General Holder's concerns that the recusal issue in the Obamacare case was being raised. And the reference to day one, uh, I, th I think, uh, has to be understood to mean as far back as could possibly be, be relevant. Now, the documentary record clearly establishes that Neil Collier's statement is, shall we say, not accurate. Uh, as Kerry has spelled out, uh, it was Neil himself, uh, Neil Collier himself, who was having this correspondence with then Solicitor General Elena Kagan all the way back in January and again in the middle of March, where he was telling her that, that he agreed that the SG's office ought to be involved in a strategy meeting and volunteered to uh, be the person to, to go and ha ask, basically asked her to assign him to go, that he uh, was telling her that he thought she should really attend this, uh, this, this meeting in March. Uh, it was so important. I, um, again, the actual language of his email is about this meeting. I think you should go, no. I, 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 will, I will regardless, but feel like this is litigation of singular importance. That's on, that's on March 21st. Now, uh, it's striking that when uh, Elena Kagan received this email containing this mistaken information about this uh, statement that uh, her political deputy, Neil Collier, made to, her, to the Attorney General Holder, she didn't say, what's your number? Call me. We need to straighten this out. Uh, she seems to have simply acquiesced in the, in the, uh, the, the mistaken statement. Uh, and uh, I think that in any other context, there'd be a lot of uh, uh, reporters in this town who'd be very interested in understanding uh, just what was going on there. But again, had there been a walling off from the beginning, uh, we need, let, let's consider what that would have meant. That would have meant, among other things, that Elena Kagan would have made clear to the people she was working with, and especially to her number two, to her political deputy, that she would not be taking part in this matter, that she should not be copied on anything here, that she would not be making any decisions at all about this. this. There's nothing in the documentary record that we see that reflects any such action being taken by her. Indeed, uh, as we've discussed, you see the opposite. You see her taking part. You see her assigning 
Neil Cadiol to be the lead person rather than, than as, as, as Kerry has explained, uh, letting him become acting head of the office by operation of law or rules, as would ordinarily be the case if someone were uh, disqualified. Now, of course, it's also striking that th there was, of course, no, no uh, basis of disqualification that Elena Kagan had. She was not ethically barred from taking part in the case. Uh, rather, um, her job responsibilities would ordinarily have required her to take part. Uh, so what we see here um, is uh, um, not a, anything that can fairly be termed a, re a recusal on her part, um, but rather uh, an effort, post hoc it seems, to distance her herself uh, from the matter so that she could take part uh, in the Supreme Court uh, uh, consideration and decision on this. And here's where I'd like to, to uh, address specifically um, what would it mean if Elena Kagan had genuinely been walled off? Uh, and I'd like to begin uh, with what I'll concede is a, is a far-fetched hypothetical, but I think it helps to distill the issues. Let's say that in January 2010, President Obama had met with then Solicitor General Kagan and told her, A, that she was a leading candidate for the next Supreme Court vacancy, B, that it was important to him that any justice he appointed be able to take part in any Supreme Court challenge to his health care legislation so the justice could vote to reject the challenge, and C, that he was instructing her not to exercise her ordinary duties as, as Solicitor General on litigation involving his health care legislation so that she would not be clearly disqualified. Again, I emphasize this is a far-fetched hypothetical. I'm not suggesting that the documentary record establishes any of this. I'm using this hypothetical uh, for, for a purpose, as you'll see. Under these facts, would Justice Kagan have to recuse herself under Section 455A because her impartiality might reasonably be questioned? I think it's clear that the question answers itself. Well, my question for you then is how the actual uh, state of events, or actually how the, how the state of events, if she'd actually been walled off, um, uh, would have played out. And my, what I would maintain is that had she actually been walled off, that walling off would have sent exactly the same messages to her as this hypothetical conversation between President Obama uh, uh, and her. She would have understood that the only reason she wouldn't be exercising the, uh, her role on this, uh, on this case was because President Obama wanted her to be able to take part in the, in, in the decision um, of the case as a justice. So uh, I, I, th I think what this shows uh, is that had she actually been walled off uh, under the circumstances, uh, the natural, uh, the, the, the uh, conclusion that follows is that she would not be able to take part in this, in this case. Uh, I'll, I'll note that uh, law professor Jonathan Turley, who's uh, on the other side politically and often on the other side uh, of me on a handful of these issues, I think has expressed uh, a very similar uh, view. Now, um, I do want to highlight that, that as, as Kerry said, the ordinary responsibilities of the Solicitor General's office kick in with Supreme Court litigation, but it, it, it's also traditionally been the case that when there's high profile uh, litigation expected, the, the Solicitor General's office will often get involved uh, in the very early stages. And indeed, we see, this is undisputed, uh, in the uh, don't ask, uh, don't tell um, uh, litigation, uh, as well as uh, in the Defense of Marriage Act, litigation. Uh, Lena Kagan was uh, very involved in the district court litigation, indeed you know, reviewing draft discovery responses, something uh, uh, quite remarkable for a Solicitor General uh, to be doing. So uh, again, I, I think the strongest uh, ground for recusal is that which Kerry has spelled out. I think it's clear that Elena Kagan was never walled off. My point is that if you accept the, the notion that she was, what would follow from that is that she'd be required to be recused under uh, 455A standard uh, when a justice's impartiality might reasonably be questioned. Thank you. Thank you. Russell. Please. <coughs> well, first, thanks very much, Tom, for You're welcome. Me. And uh, thank you for being here. I... Um, 
I, I should say, I, I think I misread the invitation. I, I was under the impression that this session was a bit more about the general question of regulation of Supreme Court <laughs> ethics and less about uh, Justice Kagan. And uh, Feel that, free to go where you want to I go. I will. That's, <laughs> just tell me why. I think it's best I not express an opinion on the Kagan matter because I'm not really in a position to get, go into all the details. Um, because I'm not familiar with them. I do have, I do have an opinion, but I think it would be irresponsible to voice it and then, then back away. Um, but this whole uh, question of whether Justice Kagan should be recused and similar questions about Justice Thomas, where I think the case is, is, a, lot, is a lot weaker, um, are, are occurring within a, a, a fair amount of, of, of discussion and and shouting about the ethics of federal judges and of Supreme Court justices, and specifically excluding the group up here, it has been largely a fact-free zone, with a lot of assertions being made that anybody who can read would know are simply not true. I may be simply nitpicking, but I think if we're going to be making policy in this area, the first thing we might want to do is get our facts straight. Now, for example, it's hard to read, um, it's hard to go very far into newspapers without hearing this statement. Um, Federal judges are bound by a strict code of conduct that regulates their behavior, but Supreme Court justices are bound by no ethical restrictions. Well, how many ways is that not true? One, federal district judges are not bound by any code. It says itself it's advisory. Two, it's not rigorous. The code of, codes of ethics are rarely rigorous. Uh, that's why the Judicial Conference has a committee to interpret the code in specific circumstances. And three, except for one except for one statute, the justices are covered by every statute, not code, every statute that governs the other, other federal judges, the judicial disqualification statute that we're talking about today, financial disclosure statutes, statutes regulating outside income and, and regulating gifts. Um, but you wouldn't know that reading the editorial pages of some of our major national newspapers, and I won't mention what they are, but you can guess. Um, now, now the one the one statute that doesn't reach the Supreme Court justices is not a, one that would be in, at issue in this disqualification debate. It instead, is a statute that allows anyone to file a complaint that a that a judge, not a justice, is engaged in what the statute says is conduct prejudicial to the expeditious and effective administration of the business of the courts. And uh, st that statute provides for complaints filed with the chief judge, and then in matters of dispute, the judicial councils of the circuits can resolve it. Now, if there's an imperfection in our judicial ethics regulations in relation to the Supreme Court, is it that there's no, there's no enforcement mechanism for the justices as there are for other judges? And if, if we were having this debate about, not about uh, Supreme Court Justice Kagan, but about Court of Appeals uh, Judge Kagan, there's a, there's, a, there's a way to deal with it. If she, if she, if she received a recusal motion and denied it, uh, the parties could file a, an appeal or they could raise the issue uh, after the case was decided, but obviously there's no court higher than the Supreme Court to decide whether Justice Kagan should recuse herself if a recusal motion were filed, and one hasn't been as far as I'm aware, and she had refused it. Uh, but there's a, there's a reason that we live with these imperfections, and that is, uh, although it might be nice to have a resolution to the question of whether she recuse herself if she were asked to do so, it's not nice to have two Supreme Courts, and that's what we would have if uh, legislation in Congress were to be enacted, which it won't, but it has the support of some 40 members that would, well, it doesn't use the term, but basically set up another court uh, higher than the Supreme Court to hear appeals from justices, recusal, refusals. Now, um, I don't want to say a lot about this bill sponsored by Democratic Cong Congressman Murphy and supported by about 40 others, but it really is another illustration, perhaps well-meaning and perhaps understandably reflecting some frustration with the judges, but uh, we can go into this if you want to talk about it in the sessions. But it really is another example of just fundamentally misunderstanding the mechanisms that have been established to regulate the ethics of, of federal judges and justices. And I might say finally that, that the federal judiciary is not, uh, is not blameless in this whole matter. I did a fair amount of work with uh, the so-called Breyer Committee that Chief Justice Rehnquist appointed to uh, uh, examine, uh, analyze the, the implementation of the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act the one that I mentioned earlier. And while we found that, by and large, chief judges were doing what the statute expected them to do when they received complaints of judicial misconduct, there really were some striking exceptions. 
uh, from people who you think would know better, Judge Richard Posner, who is no dummy, um, uh, received a complaint from uh, James Sensenbrenner growing out of the controversy that occurred at the time of the 2000 Democratic Convention and the re- release of the fact that um, there may be an inspe- Inspector General investigation of President Clinton and who, re- who released the question. Was it one of the judges on the, on the court that appoints the special, special counsel? Uh, it was a legitimate inquiry, and Posner blew it off. Uh, Chief Judge Schroeder out in the Ninth Circuit, as Professor Rotunda and I were talking, blew off complaints about a district judge out there that on its face you know, were meritorious and should have been considered. Uh, we have other examples. I mean, I was, I, 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 with everybody, I was a little confounded by Justice Thomas's failure to, re- failure to report his wife's income on the financial disclosure forms. I don't think for a moment that it was, he willfully falsified them. And he did correct them, and I think these moves by Common Cause and Alliance for Justice to uh, try to get the Judicial Conference to investigate it are simply a diversionary tactic. But again, it points to what I think could be a little more attention paid by the justices to, to these uh, the various rules that govern them. We saw this also in testimony by Justice Kennedy and Justice Breyer, uh, in which they were asked questions by members of Congress, questions that were by and large factually, factually misguided, but their responses, and we can talk about it in more detail, were, were less than satisfying. And uh, so I think, uh, I think I'm not just nitpicking here. Instead, I am, I am calling for more attention to the factual basis for this whole area, important area of federal judicial ethics regulation, because I think right now, as I said, it's largely a fact-free zone, and it shouldn't be. Now, I can talk about this more during the discussion session if you wish to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Russell Wheeler. Uh, Professor Rotunda. Can you all hear me? Thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, the Attorney General's belated release of various emails have raised the question of whether the former Solicitor General should disqualify herself uh, in this, the case deciding the constitutionality of Obamacare. Uh, and I think it's because many people think she's already made up her mind, and, and I think that's right, and, and, and for good reason. Let me give you a little background. In a series of five to four opinions over the last uh, two decades, stretching, I guess, back to the prior millennium, we might say, Congress, the court has made clear that Congress can regulate any commercial act that affects commerce among the states. Growing wheat is a commercial act. Uh, growing wheat and feeding it to your cows, so you don't have to buy wheat from somebody else is a commercial act. Not growing wheat is not a commercial act. The government could not force us to grow wheat, even though that decision, uh, like the decision not, not to buy vegetables, affects commerce. Uh, similarly, the court has said that possessing an unloaded gun near a, or a loaded one near a school is not a commercial act. Possession is not, is not commerce. Uh, the uh, Congress cannot regulate it using the commerce power. Not buying health insurance affects commerce, but it's not a commercial act. It's, it's, uh, it's not an act at all. It's an omission. I think Thomas Aquinas figured that out about 800 years ago, and about 1,400 years before that, Aristotle figured it out. Acts aren't omissions. During her con- confirmation <laughs> hearing, Senator Coburn asked Kagan whether Congress can make us eat three vegetables and three fruits every day. That would make us healthier, of course, and that would affect commerce and it affect medical costs. But it's not a commercial act that is deciding not to eat your vegetables. Uh, Kagan said, or what, actually what she could have said is, I'm not going to respond to that question because that has to do with the individual mandate, which may be before the Supreme Court. Uh, Scalia was asked a host of questions when he was nominated, and he just refused to answer because it might come before the Supreme Court. That's normally what you do. Uh, she could have said that uh, precedents appear to say that Congress cannot regulate something that affects commerce unless it's a commercial act. Uh, she didn't say that either. Instead, she said, I think it would be wrong to strike down th- such laws. Quote, I think it would be wrong to strike down such laws. She decided the individual mandate issue. Now, after her hearings, she said she would recuse herself. Actually, it was during her hearing. She would recuse herself in any case in which she, quote, uh, officially, formally approved anything, end quote, or, quote, played a substantial role, end quote. That's not the test of the statute. Uh, The statute, by the way, the particular provision, what 455B3, I think it is, um, uh, says that if you're a former federal employee, like the former Solicitor General, you must disqualify yourself if either, quote, participates as counsel or, quote, participates as an advisor or, quote, express an opinion concerning the merits of the particular case. It's not necessary that she give advice. She just has to participate as advice. 
That was a statute that was enacted after then Justice Rehnquist refused, him, refused to disqualify himself in a case involving, I think it was Melvin Laird. So Congress, I think controlled by the Democrats in, in, uh, in, in that era, uh, both houses, that is you reap what you sow, uh, made it very clear. They wanted him out of that case. Now Rehnquist, I think, was correct not to disqualify himself in that instance under the statute, but it clearly he would have to disqualify himself. He was then office, he was early in office of legal counsel under the, under the new statute. And they try to write it as broadly as you can. Now, the government, after much prodding, has belatedly reached emails that raise serious questions about whether she participated as an advisor, whether or not she was silent or gave advice. Uh, we know that her deputy attorney general emailed her about the issue and replied that she wanted to talk over the phone, sort of like, I don't want to leave a paper trail. Uh, let's talk over the phone. The deputy attorney general was the public face involving the defense while she stayed in the background, but that doesn't excuse complying with the statute. Months earlier, this goes back to January of 2010, the deputy EG said to the, uh, 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 the DOJ's Pirelli, I think an assistant attorney general, that Elena, meaning Legal Kagan, would definitely like the OSG, the Office of Solicitor General, to be involved in the set of issues, to, uh, in the, referring to the constitutional challenges of Ob Obamacare. I will bring in Elena as needed. That was in January. Uh, at the first strategy meeting, the deputy SG emphasized that getting the Solicitor General's office, quote, heavily involved even in the DCT, meaning the district court. They want the, the SG's office to be heavily involved in the district court. Now, as I pointed out, there's nothing wrong with this. It just means that if you were appointed to the Supreme Court, you couldn't be involved in that case. You're, that is, you're involved in giving advice and deciding who's going to be involved in the team, uh, involved in the decision that the SG is going to be involved at, at the district court level. Uh, in an email chain of March 21st, Pirelli sends a message to various DOG lawyers, including the deputy SG, about a meeting the next day to discuss the constitutional challenge to Obamacare. Kagan's included in this email as well. That suggests she's involved in planning for the upcoming litigation that has participated as advisor. Why would they talk to her about this if she had no role in it? Why would they do this if she were walled off? Now, there, actually, there is a procedure for walling off. You put things on a separate part of the server. You have, uh, you have uh, uh, a password protected. And you tell everybody in the office, all the assistant SGs, don't talk to her about this. That's how you would wall off. We have a procedure. The ABA model rules of ethics provide for it. The federal statute uh, adopts it. Now, the Obama administration has delayed turning over some emails, refused to turn over some other material, redacted some material that it has turned over, and has gone to court to prevent disclosure. If you had something to hide, that's the way you would act. If you've got nothing to hide, then you turn over all the materials. Now, given this evidence, it's hardly surprising that if Kagan offered her opinion that the individual mandate is constitutional, uh, after all, she thinks Congress can make us eat our vegetables. Uh, the, what's surprising, frankly, is that she refuses to disqualify herself or talk about the issue or clarify what she said in the hearings, because the hearings gave a different test. She wasn't substantially involved. Substantial is a comparative term. You know, if there's a, a meeting with five people and four of them talk and then the SG sits in the background and nods affirmatively approving this, is she substantially involved? Sounds like she gave approval, but she might say, I wasn't substantially involved, I was one of four, uh, I never said anything, I just nodded affirmatively. We don't know. And so it's calculated to make us not have, actually I think, to have uh, problems with, with the way Justice Kagan is acting in this particular case. Uh, the, I think the Attorney General should stop obstructing, promptly turn over all these emails. The things he turned over pursuant to FOIA, it took him, what, nine months? The statute says, what, 20 days? I mean, why not just, why not just turn it over? Uh, when Breyer was, uh, was testifying uh, on October 5th, he said in an answer to, um, I think it was Senator Leahy, that, that there was a, a duty for the Supreme Court to sit unless it had to disqualify itself. That is, the thumb, it appeared to say the thumb was on the scale in favor, uh, against disqualification in favor of sitting. Actually, that's the way the statute was about 25 years ago. It was changed as I said in the prior millennium. Justice Breyer is a little slow, a little back and uh, a little behind the times in reading all his, uh, all his law. Uh, it is unfortunate that we have the situation. It can easily be cleared up, uh, and I think it'd be good for the country if, if it was. Now, I happen to think, that I don't know how the Supreme Court's going to decide. I think it, it, it may well decide 
that whatever constitutional problem there is has to wait until, I think, 2014, because it's really a tax uh, and not a, not a fine. Uh, it may, may not even decide the issue, but I think she really has to be disqualified. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Well, uh, thank you, uh, everyone, Carrie and Ed and Russell and uh, Professor. The, um, you know, where this stands now, I think it's worth discussing. We have outstanding Freedom of Information Act requests. Uh, the House Judiciary Committee is uh, insisting on responses to their inquiry that's related to this issue. Uh, the problem is the Attorney General, is, uh, in his, if his testimony is to be believed or reporting on his testimony, is suggested that we can't get access to this information, that only parties who might be able to ask for her recusal can get access to it. What, what should be the next steps? You're, you're suggesting, Professor Rotunda, that she on her own explain her decision to either stay in the case or outside the case absent with, without any, any request for recusal pending? Well, I, yeah, this is all that is under the statute. The party doesn't have to make a request. In fact, under the statute, the parties could waive a disqualification based on the appearance of impropriety, which is frankly kind of a vague standard. Uh, but under the second part, it's interesting, the statute does not allow for waiver if she participated as an advisor, whether or not she participated a lot or a little. It just says they can't waive it. So con say Congress wrote this to make sure there'd never be a Justice Rehnquist. And maybe there is. Well, there are, two, there are two sets of people. I guess one set is one person, the other set is the Justice Department has all the information necessary to this, figure out how this is handled. The Justice Department, that's a separate fight with Congress or FOIA requesters. And obviously, Justice Kagan has the facts. Uh, what, what are the, how, is it we, how is it we resolve this, uh, Carrie? And, and well, I mean, there, there is no Rob. appeal from an individual justice. In practice, each justice has, has uh, informally talked to the other eight before they decide to disqualify or not. Uh, the, we know that she apparently has decided not to disqualify herself because she was involved in the decision to, to grant certiorari in the case. So she's in the case right now. Uh, otherwise, uh, I mean, the House or the Senate could hold hearings, subpoena people to testify. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the parties, I, I don't think there's really any procedure for the parties to subpoena information from the Department of Justice at this point. Uh, and it's, you know, it's nice being supreme. It's, it's, uh, there's, the only appeal from the Supreme Court is to the law reviews. Right. Mm -hmm. Russell, did you, uh, Russell, have a comment? Just a, okay. uh, I, I think, well, let me put it this way. When, when Justice uh, Rehnquist was asked to recuse himself in this case of Laird versus Tatum, he, uh, he didn't, but he wrote a memorandum of opinion explaining why he didn't. But he said that's the first time this has happened, and he just said he didn't think it ought to happen very often. Uh, and he want, went on to, to not so much go into the facts of the case as to go into why he thought the law as it, as it existed then it didn't require his disqualification. Um, now, you remember more recently when, when there was this brouhaha over whether Justice Scalia should recuse himself in the case involving Vice President Cheney's Energy Task Force. Um, and he was, again, requested to recuse. It wasn't just a matter of the press calling for it. One of the parties did. He declined, uh, and, uh, and after about a month, he wrote a memorandum opinion that I think anybody who read it would say, well, there's no problem here. I don't see why, what was the, what, what was the problem? But he, but, he, but he waited a month to lay it out. I think there's a lot to be said for the justices to be a little more open about this. Now, you don't want to get in a situation in which they're issuing press releases on a daily basis because some nut stands up and says the other disqualify themselves. But I really think a little more transparency would go, would go a long way here. And I think the, the justices have, I want to be careful how I say this, it's sort of an attitude, this is our court and we'll do what we want with it. And uh, I can see the downside of more, more openness, but boy, I can sure see some upsides to it as well. Just to comment on the um, uh, requests for information is that the, we have outstanding requests on the both the House and Senate side for more information. Representative Lamar Smith of the House Judiciary Committee um, just yet last week was continuing to press Eric Holder because he's basically the one holding, holding the information back at the Department of Justice. And it was interesting, he kept on saying, Is there, do you have a reason you haven't complied with our request? They've asked to talk to Neil Catyell, they've asked to talk to the, the uh, media person that dealt, dealt with these requests for information at, at, the, at the Solicitor General's office. They've asked for more complete information than they were giving in response to, to the FOIA requests. And 
Holder just said, well, I'm, sh I'm sure we'll, we'll get this to you if we can find it eventually, and he, but we don't think you should be asking these questions, more or less. And, and uh, Representative Smith said, do you have a constitutional privilege? Because if you don't have a privilege, then you need to be giving us this information. And he kept on just going back and saying, well, we kind of think this is the kind of thing that should come out in a, in a recusal motion, not really. But, but he never was able to come up with an actual privilege. So the bottom line is, uh, Attorney General Holder has admitted he has no reason to withhold the information, and it's really just a matter of, of holding his feet to the fire. I think he's, his feet are probably pretty warm right now on several uh, fronts, so I, uh, they, maybe they're getting a little uh, used to it. But, but um, hopefully those will come out um, eventually. And, and uh, although Justice Kagan hasn't recused herself yet, there's certainly she's free to recuse herself at any point until the decision is even released if she wanted to. But I, I'm hoping that the information will come out and, be for, and the, the DOJ will be forthcoming soon because it, right now they're just in the back of the hand. Well, I just want to add, you, I mean, you think his feet are to the fire. <laughs> when I was a, a blue collar worker, I had these steel tip boots and I think his boots have asbestos. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and I want you to answer as well, and you were in the Justice Department. I, I, my guess is you didn't have any substantial role in, 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 in meetings where stonewalling was discussed. But what do you think the thinking is over at <laughs> Justice? Well, I was going to make a slightly different point, which is I'll just note the, the oddity, it seems to me, that uh, the Justice Department has uh, emerged, I think, as, as, the, as a leading defender of Justice Kagan's non-recusal, while, of course, having uh, access to and, and and uh, preventing uh, others from, from seeing the documents that uh, would, would, would bear uh, uh, most specifically on that. So it is rather odd that now you have the Justice Department um, basically functioning as her spokesman on this. Now, to some extent, that's going to happen in lots of recusal cases where um, it's going to be a party, a judge, judge's relationship with one party that's the basis of recusal, and that party may have some information, but it seems to me it goes to uh, unusual lengths here. Well, you know, we, had, uh, we were one of the parties in that uh, Cheney Energy Task Force case, and the Sierra Club was the other party, and they wanted Scalia to recuse himself based on the fact he went duck hunting with the president, vice president. And we said, we're not suing the vice president personally. We're suing the Bush administration, the office of the vice president, the Energy Task Force, which was some sort of rump uh, uh, entity. Uh, Sierra Club uh, told us that we would be attacked if we didn't sign on to a recusal motion, which we did not do. And uh, we didn't were you think. Attacked? <laughs> I, know, I think we told everyone that they said they were going to attack us, so that prevented us, uh, prevented them from attacking us. Uh, but the point being that you know we we've come across this before, and um, uh, and there is a pat, and I, I think it's appropriate to, for Russell to point out there is a record here and, and a very important one of of uh, Justice Scalia for the public's benefit, I think, and the court's benefit explaining himself. There was nothing requiring him to r respond in, a, in, a, in an opinion like he did, but he did, and I think he settled a lot of issues in that regard. Russell. Can, can I ask you, this is not a rhetorical question of the, of the panel, but um, what's the possibility, let's put it this way, I'm sure four years from now, if some very ugly facts came out that shows without a doubt Justice Kagan should have recused herself, that's not a situation she'd want to be in. Maybe the health care survives, but her reputation goes in, in tatters. Um, that leads me to wonder whether or not uh, she is aware that the record does not contain those sorts of really damning allegations, and that is the reason she's sitting. And if she knew there were really damning allegations there, she'd do the prudent thing and get out, but she hasn't. I'd just like to hear the group's response to that. That's a good and question. I say it's not a rhetorical question at all. I'm sort of curious. Uh, I think if the record were clear, and I were the attorney general, I'd sit around and say, well, should we release all this stuff right now and show there's no problem? Or should we have it dribble out over the course of months uh, while people attack us? Who in that room would say, let's pick option two, if in fact everything is, is non-troubling? Uh, and so I, I, don't, I don't think that now. That is as to whether this will come out in five or six years. I think most people don't look that far in the future. Uh, and uh, and a lot of what may come out is really testimony. That is, she was in a room. People talked about what was said in the room. They're not going to talk. Uh, I was reading as I was reading all these things in the newspaper as I was coming down here uh, for one of the worst flights in the world, I might add. The, uh, the little children thought it was like, great, it was like a roller coaster. They loved that. But the uh, adults <laughs> were all 
all cringy. What, but what, anyway, what you do I, for justice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, I, read, uh, the, I, I notice that uh, one of the, it might have been your group, but one of the, the groups called uh, Neil uh, Cattell and sent him an email and asked various questions, as well as with Mr. Pirelli, and the response was no response. They, they didn't even say no comment. They, they just didn't return the calls. That's not what I would do if I thought there was nothing, nothing there. So they don't, they don't act that way. Russell, uh, I, I suppose uh, I would respond to your question this way. First, I think there's enough already in the, in the documents that have been made available that ought to raise real questions. But second, uh, Justice Kagan can have no confidence that she actually knows the universe of what's set for, uh, of, of, of information set forth, say, in emails from Neil Cotillal to Tom Pirelli, on which she wasn't copied. I mean, take, for example, this January 8th uh, email uh, from Neil, this is actually to Brian Hawk, who I believe worked with, with Pirelli. Brian, Elena would definitely like OSG to, to be involved in this set of issues. I'll handle this myself along with an assistant from my office and we'll bring Elena in as needed. She's not copied on this. Uh, and so she uh, simply cannot know, unless some, some sort of thorough search was done of, of the records uh, during her nomination, which seems unlikely to me. So I, I, I think that uh, to, uh, to infer that there's not um, damning information out there because otherwise she wouldn't act this way is a, is a questionable line of logic. I, I was inferring. I was just asking. Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't mean to suggest that. You were asking whether someone might reasonably infer right. that, and, I, and I, I don't think someone, some, I th someone should. I think you make a good point, though, that, that Justice Kagan is very concerned about her legacy, or I think that's the only thing left for a Supreme Court justice to be concerned with. Their job security is already there. Um, but I think if you look at her statements, actually, it suggests that she is trying to walk a very careful line mm -hmm. so that she's not found to I, either particularly have perjured herself because she's, a lot of these have been statements under oath that she's made, um, and so that she has some kind of plausible deniability down the line. Look at, um, if you look at the way she characterizes things, it's very telling, I think. Uh, first, she's very careful to keep things off the record. In, in her own things, she says, what's your phone number? But when we have uh, Tracy Schmaler, who is the, the public relations person for the DOJ, saying we're having questions about health care, and, and Neil Catyell had told her she wasn't involved at all, her immediate response is, this needs to be coordinated. Tell her not to talk to anyone until she talks to me first. So she knows this has to be worded in a particular way. She has specifically said statements like that she did not give her opinion um, on anything. She was never asked nor gave her opinion on the merits of the controversy. She m mimics the exact language of the statute. And, uh, but, but she has never said, I was never in the room. When, when asked, would she recuse herself, there was a question on the, for the record that the senator put, put, to, put to her, would you recuse herself, yourself from this litigation? She said, I was not counsel of record, okay, but that's not, of course, required. And I was not, nor did I play a substantial role in this. And Therefore, I would, I would consider the, the opinions of my colleagues and any recusal motions and any arguments made at the time, and basically I'll get back to you on that. So if, if really she had nothing at all to do with it, not only would it be more logical for them to release the documents, but she could have just said, I, I never had anything to do with this, and I, would, I will sit in the case, period. But she instead keeps on re retreating to discussions of it's a substantial role, which we know is not actually the legal standard, and and talking about um, whether she whether she was gave her opinion on things. If she was in the room, I mean, even going back to the, uh, the the coach analogy, if the coach is in the room and the offensive coordinator is giving advice, they're still sitting in the locker room with the team. You still can't be then going out and, and trying to trying to play referee. If she's sitting there listening to these conversations, she's never said she never was in the she wasn't in the room. And Eric Holder has actually said she was taken out of the room for many meetings, but his statements almost conflict with hers a little bit because she said she was there for at least one meeting. She also said she was. She was attending his meetings until April, early to mid-April. He says she was taken out of the room for these. And she, she never said she got, up, she got up and left meetings. She never said so. Oh, oh right. It's, 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 un, it's unclear what exactly happened. She also has been very careful, I think, to characterize everything that happened before the appellate level as, well, those are only informal and we keep no records of anything that happens before in district court discussions. So I think that that's, it just looks like she's very carefully trying to it just, keep yeah, out of Yeah, I added, added that many years ago. Uh, when I was assistant in majority counsel in the Senate Watergate Committee, the people on the other side said that the tapes will show that Nixon's innocent. And I said to myself, why would you have tapes that show you're innocent and then hold them back? Uh, shortly before they were released by court order, Haldeman testified under oath before the Senate Watergate Committee, said, I've heard the tapes 
and they show that Dean's a liar. He was indicted and convicted of perjury for that because the tape showed that Dean wasn't a liar. So even then, when it was in litigation on whether or not he could turn over the tapes, Haldeman lied about what they said, confident, wrongly we know, that the tapes would never be turned over. So the, I, you know, I, I represented a, um, a defendant in, in, in a death row case. I was convinced that uh, he was innocent. In fact, I even knew who did it. Uh, and uh, we fought successfully for DNA evidence. And he said that will prove I'm innocent. And it showed he was guilty. There was just one DNA evidence for the rape murder. And it was, it was only his. So people, people do things that um, I hope none of us would do. Well, you know, as I suggested earlier, I, I think the scandal here is the Justice Department's behavior. I mean, this debate, um, uh, we were all involved in it to a certain extent, uh, did revolve during her confirmation around what she would have to recuse herself on, her views especially on Obamacare. So it wasn't like this was a side, side issue. This was a central issue to her confirmation debate, at least from the point of view of conservative critics of her confirmation, of which we were critics, like critic, and I know you all opposed it as well. Um, they had documents in their possession that reflected on the Solicitor General's office involvement. And her testimony, which I think the troubling aspect of her testimony is, is that if you reviewed her testimony, she omitted seemingly the discussion and the nature of discussing the nature of her office's involvement. You would have thought there was one meeting, and it wasn't a substantial meeting, that involved her office. And these emails suggest there were more meetings involving her office. And there would have been a very different confirmation debate. So this is not necessarily a scandal about Justice Kagan and her recusal. It's necessary. It's, it, the Justice Department has been stonewalling this from the get-go, uh, which, which does take no benefit if truly she does not have the conflicts that we're suggesting. If I could just make a, a couple additional points. Uh, Carrie referred to this statements that Elena Kagan made. I want to be clear. Those statements were all before her confirmation. There's been silence from her since then. I think there's also been, I mean, there have been some statements from DOJ, but there's not been any clear response to the case that Carrie has made. Again, I don't think anyone has seriously engaged that and explained um, how or why it, um, it's wrong. I also want to highlight this uh, email chain that Kerry referred to. This is uh, May 17, 2010. So this is a week after the nomination. You first have a DOJ spokeswoman contacting Neil Cotillal, um, uh with regard to the health care uh, litigation. Has Elena been involved in any of that to the extent SG office was consulted? No, you've been point, but I expect I'll get this cue, this question. Neil Cotillal's response, you know, one minute later. No, she never has been involved in any of it. I've run it for the office and have never discussed the issues with her one bit. Well, um, again, I think the documentary record indicates that that response is not accurate. Then, then uh, about, looks like about uh, 15 minutes after that, Neil forwards his re response to Elena Kagan saying, this is what I told Tracy about health care. And uh, you know, within a minute or so, uh, Elena Kagan responds to both saying, this needs to be coordinated. Tracy, you should not say anything about this before talking to me. Well, if it were true that she's never been involved in any of it and he's never discussed the issues with her one bit, what needs coordination? Yeah. You know, the, 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 the simple answer would be, you know, thanks, Neil. Tracy has it exactly right. Uh, you know, it's as simple as that. But no, there's something here that needs to be coordinated. There, the high, before we open the floor up to questions, I think it's important. I think it would be useful to discuss the pressure being brought on, uh, attempted to be, attempted uh, pressure on uh, Justice Thomas and alleged conflicts of interest uh, he may have as a result of his uh, wife's First Amendment speech and uh, employment. Do you have any thoughts on on how that ought to be handled? Should it be handled the way that uh, the Kagan uh, recusal issue is being handled in terms of? the justice uh, disclosing uh, his analysis as to why it's not a conflict? I, I just say what I said earlier about more transparency implies the justice, in my mind, implies the Justice Thomas as well. I think he'd help himself and a lot of other people. It's a touchy situation, obviously, because you don't want to react every time somebody, someone gets on the House floor and says something, but I, I think it's a matter of judgment. I don't think it would be a bad idea for him to say more than have, than have Kathy Arbor come out and make a one-sentence statement that they're 
there's nothing there. And Kathy is the Supreme Court spokesman, right? Right. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we have these problems periodically. Uh, in 1997, people forget this, but uh, Justice Ginsburg, we learned, violated federal law 21 times since 1995 by participating in cases where her husband owned stock. And the federal statute is quite clear, also enacted some years ago in response to um, uh, Judge Hainsworth, I think. Uh, that is, if you or your spouse own stock in a company, even one share, you must disqualify. You know, even one share, you must disqualify yourself. Uh, and her answer was, I made a mistake, I'm sorry. And she stopped doing it. Uh, and I, I think they should, you know, she's a Supreme Court justice. Uh, the, she, uh, she should have made sure she didn't make a mistake. Thomas also made a mistake. There was a difference in, in, uh, in the Insight Report, there was very little press about it. That was the end of it. In the Thomas Report, where he didn't disclose his wife's work for Heritage, which was on the Heritage webpage, uh, there was a liberal group that moved to disbar uh, Clarence Thomas. That's pending someplace, I guess. Uh, the, I think the justices should be following the statute. This also happens in the lower court, where judges refuse to disqualify themselves. They, they say they're not aware of it, and that may well be the case. But we have simple solutions. I mean, they could buy mutual funds. They don't have to disqualify that themselves at all. But if they insist on owning stock, they should, should know that, that uh, uh, Disney owns ABC. I think that's one of the, I mean, there's only, there's only about three corporations in the world. They all own each other. And, and, uh, and Putin is, the, is involved somewhere in the background. But no, but, no, but, but, but seriously, they do make mistakes. I agree with Russell that, that for, I think for the most part, maybe 99, 9 tenths percent, they're just, they're just mistakes. But they, they should be more careful about it. And they, they should, they, uh, they, they, they should have, a, a computer can tell you, a computer can tell you to withdraw, uh, uh, disqualify yourself if you own the company or a sister <laughs> company or subsidiary. In fact, that's what law firms have uh, computers that do this for them because they have a problem. If they're representing Disney, they shouldn't be suing what? ABC. Well, you and know, it's we, all figured out then. Well, we've asked for the judicial financial disclosure forms because it was difficult to get access to them. And if you were a litigant, you didn't want the judge to know you were asking questions about his or her uh, and, uh, financials uh, so you could uh, re research. And to this day, was it seven years after we began asking, we get printed copies of their financial disclosure forms, and we PDF them and put them on the internet. The judicial the, the uh, judicial conference refuses to to computerize the whole system. Tom, on your question about Justice Thomas and the Obamacare case, I think uh, with any question of recusal, it's important to understand just what the allegations are and to understand what the facts are. I've been trying for the last year or so to understand just what the, what the allegations are here. I think it's fair to say that, that a whole range of folks who have looked at them care, uh, carefully, including the Washington Post recently, have dismissed them as meritless. I gather there's one allegation that, that uh, T Justice Thomas ought to recuse himself because uh, his wife used to work for Heritage, and Heritage opposes Obamacare. Well, at the time his wife worked for Heritage, Heritage was supporting a uh, health care reform plan that included an individual mandate. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure that what the linkage is uh, in those allegations, but uh, it would be, seems quite a stretch uh, to, to, make that, uh, to turn that into recusal. Now, I think there are other uh, allegations, and I'm not sure I've seen the evidence for them, and if there is evidence, I'd be happy to, to look at it. And I, didn't come prepared to, to address this specific topic, but that, uh, that uh, organizations that um, Mrs. Thomas uh, is now or has recently been affiliated with have, uh, you know, opposed Obamacare on policy grounds. Uh, well, you know, uh, and, and therefore sh she may have some financial interest in Obamacare being struck down on constitutional grounds. That strikes me as a non sequitur. That is, if you, if, if, if she were, which I understand this isn't the case, if she were being engaged to, say, lobby against Obamacare, you'd think it'd be important to the future of her business that Obamacare stay around for her to lobby against for, for political <laughs> appeal. In any event, I, I haven't been able to make heads or tails of, of the allegations or just what exactly they rest on. Perhaps, uh, again, if there is something that, that some of you are aware of and can document, I'd be happy to, to address that, but it just seems like um, a lot of smoke. What's, what's the reason behind it, Gary? I mean, I, I think it's a lot of smoke, too, but there's, got, yeah. there's, a, there's an agenda, presumably. Uh, the, the, the only rational, I mean, they, 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 there's a couple of reasons. One is that people sort of love to hate Justice Thomas. He's, he's you know, they say he's, he's 
a traitor to his race, et cetera, or whatever, because he's because he's conservative and black. So maybe maybe they're just still annoyed at him for being nominated for being confirmed in the first place. I don't know. But I think the, I think the clearer point in this case is there is a real case for the the uh, recusal of Justice Kagan, and even those who who may, maybe don't agree with us that the case is already clear enough on the facts that we have would say that the Thomas arguments are frivolous in the, in, in the, there's, in the, the Kagan arguments is a closer case. I'm talking about the people that, aside from common cause and kind of the, the post. Yeah, yeah so, so there's, I think it's a clear um, smoke screen to try to distract from the real issue. If, if there is any justice that needs to recuse himself, it is definitely Justice Kagan and not Justice Thomas. Have, have, has anyone read an article about Justice Thomas's recusal that, for example, cited to a federal statute? that addressed any actual real issue aside from vague notions of appearance of impropriety and they've even made claims for everything from you know Justice Scalia should recuse himself because he went to a Federalist Society dinner and the Federalist Society has a lot of people who are interested in this even though they don't hold the specific position themselves and some of the parties in the case might have sponsored tables at the dinner. I mean so so broad that it could cover recusal of on a host of um, different events and, uh, and for almost you know any case that comes up, so there the, the allegations are completely broad, and they're and they're not only operating in a fact-free zone, they're operating in sort of a law-free zone, and just at the level of insinuation. But the the um, issue, the part that I think is the most uh, egregious about the the anti-Thomas allegations is there's sort of a hint of corruption being suggested. That well, she has um, lobbying clients at, who lobby for conservative things, and so maybe she can try to get the justice to to she can deliver the justice's vote or something. I mean, if that were happening, that is a, an impeachable offense level of complete corruption in the court. That's obviously, no one will even make, clearly draw, the, connect the dots when they're making those allegations because it would be atrocious to make such an, such an allegation. And remember who first uh, raised the, this allegation against Justice Thomas, uh, Anthony Weiner, who I think was spending uh, more time taking uh, shots of his uh, uh, <laughs> photos. Uh, uh, too much information, too much information. <laughs> you don't need to finish that sentence. Go ahead, Russell. <laughs> broader comment, though. I think you got several things operating here that are going to change the landscape. One is the justices seem to be much more inclined than in earlier years to, to, to galley forth and, and do book reviews and speeches. I mean, they're just out there more. Um, second, there's a, there's a news media that keeps track of it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah. Uh, so we know a lot more about it. So I think what's going to happen, again, I'm, I'm exempting the people on the panel from what I'm about to say, but I think there's a lot of people who would sign on to any recusal motion against a justice they thought was going to decide against, against them just because it could be a tactic if not to get the justice removed, at least to legitimize a decision. So you've got, you've got the justices are out and about, they're, be, they're being seen out and about, and now you've got this recusal fervor, and I think that's just going to be part of the landscape for a while. Well, that's right. I mean, when we were at this, you know, the Scalia issue, there was never really any case in the inter any. There was, we did not foresee Justice Scalia ever being a vote in favor of Judicial Watch uh, in the Cheney Energy Task Force <laughs> case. But you know, there there is an ethical approach that can be taken in some of these cases. You sometimes yeah. let judges sit on cases that you know are yeah. likely to rule against you. I mean, I think that is. I think uh, uh, if I think the federal statute now basically treats the husband and wife as one. I think it only in two instances: owning stock, and if the uh, uh, if the wife were a lawyer on the brief, could be in the law firm, but not on the brief. Uh, if they want to cover other situations involving spouses, they could do that by statute. I mean, we have a specific statute in, in uh, the Kagan case. We don't have such a statute in the uh, Thomas situation. There are problems with covering, uh, I mean, spouses. Uh, Justice Breyer's spouse, I believe, is an MD and I think has some very strong views on, on abortion and, and right to choose. Uh, Judge Reinhardt in the uh, Ninth Circuit, his wife has been very active on the gay rights situation. She, uh, her organization filed briefs in that very case. Yeah, but she's not a lawyer. The organization filed briefs, but she's not a lawyer. And, and so you have the general appearance standard, but Judge you don't have... And Judge Rendell up in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I mean, and, and, so, and, I, and I do think uh, that, uh, I don't know if Russell said this, but I, 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 that is the, uh, I, I think that judges should lie lower in the grass. I think they should write fewer books. Uh, they should uh, have fewer dog and pony shows going around the country articulating uh, their, their views on all these issues. I think it's, it is, uh, uh, Justice Scalia told me once, it's because we, there often aren't pictures of justice. They're, they're in my book. I have the pictures of them. So you see what they look like, but they usually aren't. And he went to, um, uh, he and his, what is it, I don't know, his bevy of kids and wife, they went to the hotel and they signed in. 
and uh, uh, he sends Antonin Scalia, and the, the fellow turns around, the, the concierge, and said, oh, welcome, Mr. Scalia. And he said, it's Scalia. He said, oh, like the justice. He said, yes. So <laughs> I think it's, I, best, I guess it's best if we know uh, if, uh, you know, Justice Harlan, when he became a justice, refused to vote. He said, I don't, and I, I think that's going too far, but his view is I'm out of it for partisanship. And that has not been the, the White House once in the morning, I would put it forward. <laughs> oh well, yeah. And the medicine ball yeah, the medicine you ball. You only really take right. this ethics thing so far. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, let me uh, open. Uh, thank you, like the panel, but I want to open up uh, to any questions from by yourself and wait for the microphone. Right here. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Broadnecks. I'm a University of Maryland University College student, legal studies, business administration, getting ready to go to law school. So this is very interesting. Now, my question pertains to if Justice Kagan is recused or not recused, how does that impact the Attorney General? Because it does seem to be a big issue if these allegations are true, that he has helped to obstruct the investigation. How would you hold him accountable? Just another straw on the camel's back. I mean, he's got uh, lots of charges against him. Uh, you know, bad judgment in the, uh, as well as I think what now charges of misleading Congress in the Fast and Furious. Uh, I never saw the movie, but I've read about the, uh, uh, the thing. So he just, he just has another set of problems. Should they we, have we may never know the answer. That is, uh, if she does disqualify herself, it may be they don't release any of these documents. They, does he have a conflict, or any of his appointees have a conflict in terms of deciding whether to release other documents, given the, the fact they're parties to the litigation with an interest in? I, I think that usually FOIA cases involve people with interest in the case. They're supposed to look at it and, and, and just release the documents. But, if the, but the, the interest outside, it, in terms of his litigation, the stance of the Department of Justice representing the government in Obamacare. And, and, and the fact that these, they're in a position to make decisions about documents, the release of which might cause a vote likely in their favor to disappear. Does that raise any conflict issues? I'm not I don't sure know. under FOIA. I'm just asking. Yeah, I don't I, know. I, 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 really, I haven't really thought about it. I'm agnostic. Well, well I think that situation is, is going to arise often uh, when the FOIA request involves a case where a, a government entity is, is, a, is, a, is a party. And so... I mean, is there some sort of, you know, on some general level conflict of interest? Sure, but but, right. but uh, that uh, that doesn't affect the fact that they have to carry out their duty, and we expect them to carry out their duty, and we trust that, they, that they'll carry out their duty. Mm -hmm. I think the bottom line is that the check on on Attorney General Holder is is basically political. I mean, the the heat that he's getting reflects not only on himself but on his boss, the president, and the president could remove him. At any time, so it, it, as long as he's he's still there, the president is in some ways taking a little bit of the um, of the heat as well because he's he's chosen as the attorney general and he's hasn't hasn't removed him yet. So every time something comes up, you know, there's it makes it more and more likely that this guy's just going to have to leave office or be asked to resign or you know. Well, what's your feel for the way the Republicans are handling us on the Hill? Are they serious about it or are they just making noise for political effect? I think particularly now that. Uh, I think they're concerned about this issue, but in particular, you see people, the senators who are on the Judiciary Committee are concerned. They, they are in less of a position to make noise because they don't have any subpoena power at the, at the moment, but um, are very concerned that they, they, these documents were withheld from them. It should have been on their tables during the nomination process. But and now that particularly the, the Attorney General Holder is, um, is giving uh, Representative Smith the runaround, uh, even if he weren't interested in it, uh, it before, which I, which I think he was, now he's really interested because this is a, this is a challenge to the authority of Congress to request documents. Any other questions? Yes. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Emily Walker. I'm a reporter with MedPage today. Um, Professor Rotunda, you kind of already ventured to guess what you think the outcome of the Affordable Care Act case will be in the Supreme Court, but I'd be interested to hear the rest of you no, think, it, say it, what you think. Just to clear, that is, I told you what I thought. I really have no idea what, what it might be, though I do think there's a good chance the court will say that it's a tax mm -hmm. and postpone the decision mm -hmm. for a couple of years. Any educated guesses? Uh, I, you know, 
my guess is no better than anyone else's. I, I think uh, it's uh, reasonable to expect a result uh, somewhere between uh, striking down the mandate five to four and upholding it by, uh, you know, six to three or seven to two or even eight to one. But in there, you know, it's, it's anyone's guess. I don't pretend to have any special insights. When I was clerking for Justice Thomas, he used to always have, before he told us what the votes were, he would have all the clerks make their guess as to what the vote count was. <laughs> and his point was simply, you have lots of inside information on this case. You've been talking to the other clerks, the other justices. If anyone knows it can make a good guess, it's you. And the, the amount of time that we were way off on our votes was meant to um, just give us a little humility. So I, I, I don't think I could, I could uh, speculate beyond the fact that it'll, it will be important and it probably will be close. So what would be the result, effectively, if, let's say, Justice Kagan, um, for the public, if Justice Kagan did recuse herself and it resulted in 4-4 ties, how would that work out? Chaos. <laughs> Does that, would, 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 is that, I mean, what I... What you have is, wouldn't you have, you'd have the laws, the mandate's not operating in the three states of the 11th Circuit, probably is in the four states of the 6th Circuit in D.C., and who knows elsewhere. I, th mm -hmm. I think that's right. And then, Except uh, that then you've got the, the 26 gates who are plaintiffs, so it seems like the law of the case ought to apply to them, and what happens when... If, as to them, because if it's a 4-4 decision, the case below stands, and that holds it unconstitutional. So as to uh, a state, you know, that's, that's in maybe the Sixth Circuit that's held it constitutional, but the state is in a case where it's one of the parties and it says it's unconstitutional, it, it's, a, it's a bizarre outcome. I don't know. And Professor Rotana, your analysis is that the prospect of chaos is not a reason to stay on the case for Justice Kagan if well, there, recusal I mean, is no, required. There's no exception under the statute yeah. for that. And, and, and uh, what we'd have, I suppose, is a regime where the law would be different in different states. We tolerate that all kinds of places and other circumstances, and it does give us uh, uh, an ability to see how the law is working in some places compared to others. I mean, one of the troubles, and this is more of a policy argument, but it relates to all these decisions about uh, uh, what Justice, uh, was it uh, Brandeis said, that the, the, the states are laboratories. We can see how things work out. We have Romney care in Massachusetts, see how it works out compared to some other states. Uh, if we if we did it that way, we would find some places work better than others. Then, uh, and maybe that's what we'll find out with, with, with the statute. We have very few four to four cases. Uh, we, all of the desegregation cases until, I think Chief Justice Berger got on the court, were all unanimous. Uh, the court decided that, that it was important. They speak with one voice. And uh, I, somehow it'll work out. That is, it, it will. Uh, it'll. It'll work out. Well, I think if, if look, if Justice Kagan were to recuse, I think the remaining eight justices would go to extraordinary efforts to find a way to make sure you did not have four-four affirmed by an equally divided court. I, 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 I do not think that that would that 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 result would result in would yield anything at all workable. I, uh, I think it would be utter chaos, which might make help make the. Uh, the case for the political imperative of repeal, but I, I do think that the justices would uh, look long and hard for some uh, some some basis of, uh, for ruling that would get yeah. uh, a majority. Yeah, certainly Chief Justice Roberts is all on board with that analysis. Mm -hmm. It would seem, given his statements, and, and you know, it, it would put the ball back in the court of Congress. I mean, there there are ways to have nationwide health care uh, without an individual mandate. Uh, the the I mean, we too, too complex to go into now, I suppose, but I think. The purpose of the individual mandate and many of the complexities of Obamacare are to hide the real cost. And if Congress just gives the real cost, uh, you know, you get welfare, whether or not you paid into a welfare fund, you just get welfare. They, we, we could have, uh, we could have uh, uh, national health care. Including uh, coverage of pre-existing conditions with yeah. high-risk pools. There are lots yeah. of conservative health care analysts, including my colleague uh, Jim Capretta, who have spelled out a way to do this that, that uh, mm -hmm. Would be, would be in many respects uh, a lot better than uh, the, the current approach. Uh, any other questions? Yes, yeah, right here, right here. He deferred this, Jill, right here. I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Paul Jossi. I'm just representing myself here as a lawyer in Washington, D.C. Um, my question is, is there any recourse against either Eric Holder or the Department of Justice in general for clearly withholding documents that the Senate Judiciary Committee had asked for um, during her nomination process. And if there's not, what is to stop uh, another, uh, a, a future administration from doing the same thing? Well, if you, get, if you get a court that orders it, then it's easy, because the court puts them in contempt. We saw this 
with the refusal of the Department of Interior to release a lot of documents relating to Indian reservations showing corrupt and, and stupid uh, Department of Justice policy that is bipartisan, it's, that is stupidity and corruption are, are bipartisan. But I think you've got to get a judge to get intervened. Now, the, the, the Judge Huvel, which she said that she thought documents relating to the Solicitor General talking to other officials in the Department of Justice about her efforts to get on the Supreme Court were personal, not government interest. That surprises me. Another judge might disagree. I mean, ultimately, it's, it's, the, it's the courts we use to control. The courts in the newspapers, I think, leaks are good things. I mean, that's how we find out what's going on. Uh, leaks are good things no matter who the administration is. There are a lot of objections uh, to leaks involving uh, efforts to control terrorist funds. Uh, when the New York Times will, we well, live on leaks. Well, there are political checks as well. I'm not, yeah. I'm not familiar with the state of the record that underlies your question, you know, whether there were um, specific requests uh, made by the Senate Judiciary Committee to the Department of Justice that, that can be shown not to have been fully answered. Tom may, may right. have the best read on that. If that were the case, though, you know, you have to pound them politically, demand an explanation, and uh, I think that's, that's your route. Well, and I say this in a nonpartisan way. Effectively, oversight is weakened and weak when you have both parties controlling the executive branch, and in this case, the Senate. So you're not going to have any effective accountability. And I would say the same would go if there was similarly held, if, if the situation was reversed and the Republicans were overseeing a Republican administration. They're not going to hold them to account, even though I'm sure there are staff in the Justice uh, in the Judiciary Committee on the majority side who are, are upset with the way they were treated here. If, if you know, there, there is something to be said. The Senate, whether the Republican or Democrat, they are sensitive about oversight. They don't like to be rolled. And it looks to me they may have been rolled here. And, um, and my guess is Democrats in quiet moments would tell you that privately. Someone but practically else. speaking, they're not going to do anything about it. Someone else had a question. Yes, back here. Gary Meredith with American Target Advertising. Um, after the, the contempt that Eric Holder seems to show for uh, the, the Congress and, and uh, his own job and professionalism and, and the law, um, what, uh, what confidence would we have that anything he produces under a FOIA would be responsive to the request, that thorough or, or clear? I mean, it, it seems bizarre that well, he can just say no. Well, there's a legal process, and you can challenge the withholdings, and, and uh, they're required to document the nature of their search and any documents they withheld. So there is a legal process, and you would hope the Justice Department lawyers involved would disclose the universe of information that had been out there. I think what's interesting in the emails that came to us just a few weeks ago, uh, you know, there was no explanation as to why they were turned over to us as late as they were. I mean, these were responsive to requests we had made the previous year. Uh, the decision at the federal district level had already been made. Uh, so, uh, you know, they just turned them over to us, so there was no explanation. But you just have to trust the system does work, and it does work in this regard because the litigation did result in documents coming out that has led to a measure of accountability for not only the administration, uh, but whatever she does, Justice Kagan is going to have to grapple with this over the long run as to what her role was in Obamacare. Yes. Just, just a, a brief comment, though, that is, it is, you know, you never really know. We know that Nixon ended up turning, up, turning over a lot in, in, the, in the Watergate tapes case that were, frankly, damning, but we never got the 18 and a half minutes. That would have been nice. We just, we, we never know. It's an imperfect process, but yes. it, it is a process. Yes. It's not helpless, yeah. Yes, right here. Hi, I'm Destiny Decker with Traditional Values Coalition, and I just, m this may not be a question, um, maybe just an observance, because I was in the judiciary hearing last week where um, Eric Holder was being questioned, and it was the most fun I've ever had in my life. Um, but there, it seems that there's a very stark difference in his admission that he was not ever brought in the loop, and, you know, the 5,000 emails that have been released on Fast and Furious, none of them have his name on it, and yet Kagan specifically requested that her office be involved before the litigation had been processed. So maybe, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that very large difference of Eric Holder having, there's no record of him being involved and he continually said, I don't know, somebody else handled it. I don't know, somebody else handled it. And yet there's a very clear proof that Kagan 
was brought in the loop, that she was, you know, her name is on email. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about that difference. Um, you talking about uh, Holder and Fast and Furious? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought when Fast and Furious came out, and some more low-level people made stupid mistakes. What else is new? Uh, and the, I think the trouble with Fast and Furious was not the initial mistake, but, but the cover-up. And Unholder says, I wasn't involved earlier. And what's coming out now is that he was involved in the decision not to turn over some documents or made statements that were inconsistent with the documents. So, so for him, like many things, I think it's, it is the possible, it's the possible cover-up. Uh, plus, the decisions on Fast and Furious went up higher than, th than, than I thought. Uh, and for Kagan, it is, I think it's a problem. That is, she, I mean, can you envision Neil Cattell saying in January, uh, I'd like the SG's office to be involved, but we better not tell Kagan about this. That would seem like kind of insubordinate. I mean, he never said that in emails, of course, but how can, how can they, and we're talking about a small office. You know, you get all the lawyers together in the SG's office and there's, there'd be empty chairs in this room. Uh, and so it, it's, just, it's hard to figure out how she could be involved and the decision was made to be involved, but, but she wasn't involved. So that's, that's just a problem. It's not the most natural interpretation of, of the documents that have been released. Um, uh, one last question. Uh, Jeff, up front here. Jeff Lyon. I'm affiliated with Judicial Watch. The question would be, usually you have three judge panels for appeals in certain cases or en banc panels. So with the issue of Supreme Court justices, what is the prohibition against having, with respect to recusal, an appeal to a three-judge panel of Supreme Court justices or an en banc panel? And, of course, as part of this, just as uh, Justice Scalia did with his 30-page uh, explanation, there would be some back and forth in writing that would avoid this extra Supreme Court that we're talking about. It's all in-house, but there's more transparency. The issues are reduced to writing back and forth. That's the question. Thank you, Jeff. This Russell, go ahead. This arose uh, during the, uh, the debate over the court packing plan when people said, well, if the court got too big, it could sit in panels. And the Chief Justice said, of course, he was opposed to the court packing plan, but he said, I don't think the Constitution even authorizes the court sitting in panels. It authorizes one Supreme Court. And if you start to go down that road, just think of where you go. Well, let's have set up a special panel to hear gun cases. So let's, you know, I mean, it, it probably wouldn't happen, but why mess with it? So uh, practically... Uh, That's somewhat speculative. Well, well, it's a lot of it's well the, 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 you know, there, there, Leahy's got this proposal. We use a retired justice. Well, who picks the retired justice? Uh, he said the chief justice. And even if it's the chief justice or a roll of the dice or whatever it is, you'd ha you would have two Supreme Courts. You'd have eight plus this temporary guy. That is, that's kind of the junior varsity Supreme Court. Then you'd have the real nine in other cases. So we've never done it before. I mean, it was Chief Justice Hughes that raised the question whether there's one Supreme Court because Roosevelt... Uh, said let's operate and he thought we'd make a larger I mean people saw through what he was doing because anyone who's been on a committee knows that when you double the size of the committee you, you double the work you don't have it uh, and that was on the court yeah and you would just double the size of the work you don't make half the work so it is it is a particular problem it's something that seldom happens we have very few four to four decisions uh, and uh, I'm just a little uh, concerned about uh, changing a lot because of something that uh, would not solve this case if you're considering, you know, because she would still say, I'm not disqualified. And you would have, what, the other eight justices, would they be subpoenaing the, uh, the documents from the Justice Department? It's, uh, and how could they enforce it against her even if they ruled against her? Well, yeah, well, I mean, I think I, I, I'll register a mild dissent on this point. I don't like the panel idea at all, but I do think that uh, there would be authority for the Supreme Court as a whole to second guess a uh, particular justice's decision. Now, as it happens, there are nine justices who are never going to like that sort of system, or, yes. aren't going to like being second guessed by, by eight others. That's never going to happen. I'm not sure it's a good idea, um, but I think that would be a, a constitutionally. Uh, See how it's actually written. But they're never going to do that. And one thing, uh, and I think this goes back to the point Russell made about how the federal judiciary isn't blameless. Um, you know, I think you see in uh, judges and justices um, a 
um, you know, confidence that their own calls on these things are always right and aren't to be second guessed. Uh, and uh, I do think that, uh, as Russell was saying, a little more transparency, a, a little more willingness to do what Justice Scalia did back in whatever it was, 2003, uh, in the Energy Task Force case. It would, would, would it'd be, it'd be good to see more of that. And I actually hope that, uh, I don't know how many, how many parties there actually are in this, uh, in this uh, healthcare case, but I'd like to see uh, one of them have the gumption to, uh, to, to file a motion to recuse, and perhaps that would uh, trigger uh, some sort of explanation from Justice Kagan as to the actual basis upon which she believes she can take part in this case. There, there is a problem if you're the attorney that does that, because you have other cases before the Supreme Court, and there's a concern. The ABA procedure for disqualification is that, it, that the party makes a motion, but the judge doesn't know about it. And then outside the presence of the judge, the, the lawyers and their parties, and, and the parties, waive the disqualification. And then the judge is told there either is a disqualification, there was a waiver or not, and never knows who. Uh, they're worried what they call about the iron fist and the velvet glove. And what we find in, in courts that have this rule, because the judges don't read about the law, uh, they will they'll have the parties before them and says, Your Honor, uh, uh, your daughter is, is, uh, is, is a member of the firm and on the brief, whatever. And he says, and a fine lawyer she is. Oh, of, thank you. Thank you, uh, says the judge. Now, no one here objects to that. This is from an actual case. Uh, no, no, no. Everybody falls over themselves. So it's not, the parties don't know. It's the lawyers waving the right in front of the judge. Uh, and, uh, and then it goes on. So I do think more transparency. I think if you had this eight-person rule, you're not going to get it by internal rule. But, but I don't know if the court would invalidate a statute. Now, when uh, about four years ago, five years ago, uh, there was a proposal for an inspector general for the courts with fairly modest power, uh, particularly over the Supreme Court, appointed by the Chief Justice, and, uh, and the, the Democrats didn't like it. Now if there was such a proposal, maybe the Republicans wouldn't like it. Either side, there always seem to be somebody on the other side. Well, um, Carrie, unless you have a... Oh, I was going to say that I, I think having more transparency, everyone could help themselves. It, it, and mm -hmm. one thing I wish I wish I, we could see is the Judicial Conference has a committee for looking into some of these ethical issues. It would be, I think it'd be wonderful to, just to have a third party set of eyes on this case so no one can say, well, you're just saying that because you want the case to come out this way or that way. It would be, I, I would love to see Justice Kagan say, you know what, I'm going to submit it to this, this committee. And uh, even if she's saying I'm not going to be bound by it, but it, while at least publicize, you know, the result, so advisory, or let them an advisory an advisory, giving mm -hmm. advisory opinion on the it. Justices do ask for those. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, she, and for all we know, actually, she may have because they're, they're I'm assuming they're, they're confidential. But it would be nice to be able to say, you know, and, and I think Justice Breyer did something like this, although I don't know if it was that Maybe committee. Maybe about sending it to sentencing. Maybe. Exactly. So, I mean, at least at least you could say, hey, I've thought through this issue and I have some outside, you know. Well, in her testimony, she said she would she do the she analysis. Would. She would do the analysis for a recusal on this specific case, and I think we all are in agreement, at least, that if, if that analysis has been done, that she share it uh, with the American people. Because I think if she continues to sit on this case, uh, and her vote will be tainted absent a further explanation from, her, from, from Justice Kagan. Uh, Carrie Severino, Ed Whelan, uh, Russell Wheeler, and Ron Rotunda, thank you for your excellent... Uh, input and participation. I think this not only got to the heart of the Kagan matter in significant ways, but raised new and important issues about ethics in the Supreme Court generally. And we appreciate your, your contribution to our panel. Thank you very much.